scripture reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 through 18. Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, exhorting them, encouraging them. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, and he was going through the regions of of, of the areas of Samaria and Galilee. And as he was walking, there were ten men who stood afar off, and these ten men had a terribly painful condition called leprosy. Uh, We don't really know or haven't seen a lot of leprosy in our society, but it was a terrible condition that was very painful and and really quite debilitating. And and in some situations, painful situations, it it could even lead to death. And and these men called out to Jesus, saying, Lord, uh, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus looked over at them, and, and he saw these men see... According to the law, they, they were to be kind of separate. It was, it was a contagious disease. And so they were kind of separated from everybody else. And, and there was rules about purification. And, and when you got over the disease, you had to go present yourself to the priest and, and all of those types of things. And so Jesus looked at them and told them, go present yourself to the priest. And as they went, they noticed all ten of them were healed. And... And though all ten were healed, one returned, and, and one fell on his face. And, and if you read chapter 17, uh, verses 15 and 16, it says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down on his face to his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So though ten were healed, one returned. And Jesus pointed that out. He said, "Uh, were there not ten healed and only one is returned? See, what Jesus did was he pointed out something very obvious. Ten men healed, one returned to give thanks. He said, where are the nine? I mean, that's a simple question. Uh, Where are the nine? Were not ten healed? Why is it that just one came back and gave thanks? You know, this week is Thanksgiving. I like Thanksgiving. And it's not just because of the turkey, though. I like that as well. But it, it's such a, a neat time, I believe, to be thankful and, and to set back and, and to consider all the things that we have to be thankful for. And really, I want to submit to you this morning that, that as Christians, we have more to be thankful for really than anybody in this world. I mean, there's so many physical blessings that God has blessed this world with. And so many things that, that we can look around. And, and the truth is this, if, if you're breathing air this morning, then you've been blessed. And if you have clothes on this morning, then you've been blessed by God. But even more than that, God has blessed Christians so much more. I mean, we start to talk about the hope we have and, and we start to talk about the forgiveness of sins and we start to talk about the, the idea and, and, and the reality that one day we can go be with God and we realize we, we just have been blessed beyond measure, blessed more than we could count. You know, we sing that song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And, and I tell you, if you try to sit down and do that, you're going to realize we can't count them all. I mean, the blessings that God has given to us are, are so beyond our ability to count. And I want to talk about that this morning, the things that we should be thankful for. And I'm going to do it in this way. I want to talk about being thankful for the past, the present, and the future. Point number one on your outline is this. We should be thankful for the past. You know, one of the greatest reasons I think that we should read the, the Old Testament is that 
is, is you read through the Old Testament, you read there in Genesis chapter 3 of the very first sin. All right, the fall of mankind. God put man and woman, Adam and Eve, in the garden. He told them of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat, but the tree in the midst of the garden you shall not eat, for the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17. And you know as well as I do, they ate. Right? They ate that forbidden fruit, and, and sin was ushered into this world. And one of the neat things about the Old Testament is that you see what man had done in bringing sin into this world. And immediately, God's working a plan to forgive man. God's working a plan to, to wash sin away. And you read through the Old Testament. And I mean, you have that first sin there in Genesis chapter 3. And you don't read but three chapters. And the whole world had turned against God. Right, if he, or Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 says, And the thoughts and tents of man's heart was only evil continually. I mean, man turned away from God, and they turned away from God fast. And you read through the Old Testament, and you read about all the different things that man had done, the sins, the violence, the immorality, and all the wickedness that man had done. And all along, you see God providing a way to forgive man. All along, you, you see this thread that, that God came to a man named Abram at the time and told Abram what he needed to do. And, and Abram had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob, and Jacob had a bunch of kids, and, and they grew up to be this nation. And, and you start to read about this nation, and, and all it's doing is bringing us to the day that Christ would come. And you read through the past and the things that were done in the past so that today... We could have hope. You read through the things that, that different people did in the past so that today we could sit where we're sitting. And today we can worship God and we can be thankful to God as people who are free from our sins. As people who have hope. As people who have been shown grace and shown mercy. And you think of all the things that had been done in the past. And, and I don't want you to forget that. Uh, we can't forget all the things that individuals have done. I mean, think about the things that individuals have done, people have done for us on our behalf. And you think today, neat thought, today I can walk across the street and go to Walmart and I could buy a Bible for $5. I mean, the Holy Word of God for $5, about the price that it costs to buy a Happy Meal, right? I mean... For $5, I can have God's word for me, or written out, and I can read. You realize that hasn't always been true. I mean, people have died, given their lives, because they owned God's word and they weren't supposed to. Or they, or they translated God's word into an English language or a different language. So, so God's word can spread. You read about people, even in the Bible, men like Paul and Peter and, and the different things that they went through. So God's word can spread. And, and even throughout history, people that, that aren't necessarily even written in scripture, the things that people have done. So you and I could possess God's word just, just as easy as we have it. Right. I, I have it right here on this podium. But you can go into my office and you can find it in a bunch of different... Uh, you can find it in, in my office in, in different translations. I have it on my phone. I have it on my tablet. I have it on my computer. And, and not just one, but, but hundreds of different... Trans I mean, God's Word is, easy, is more easily available today than it has ever been. But don't forget that it hasn't always been that way. I want you to appreciate it and think about it. And think about what people have done. But, but even more than that... Think about what's been done in the past as far as what Christ has done for us. I mean, it's because of what Christ did nearly 2,000 years ago that, that the, the Bible means anything to us. That we could have hope, that we could have forgiveness. You know, sometimes we get, we get so focused on, on the things that we want right now that we forget about all the things that have been done before. You know, even, even just from a personal level. You know, I, some, some in here are, I guess we'd call them first generation Christians. I mean, maybe their parents weren't Christians, but, but at some point they heard the gospel and they were converted to Christ. Now, I, I was blessed. I, I have 
parents that both of them are members of the church and 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 even beyond that both both sets of grandparents are members of the church but beyond that that's not true i tell you, I, I don't know who it was I, I don't know the person's name but at some point somebody sat down with my grandparents and studied the gospel with them i tell you i thank god for that I thank God that today I stand here a product of a Christian home because somebody at some point sat down and studied the gospel with my grandparents. I think that's neat, and, and I'm thankful for that. And I, I tell you, I think, I think of, uh, I know we're talking about the past right now, but I, I even in this sense think of the future and think about what will I be to my grandkids. Right? Will, I, will I be the one that, that continued the legacy? Right? Will I be the one that, that, that is a reason that, that my kids grow up faithful? Or will I be the one that, that is a reason my grandkids grow up faithful? Or, or will I be the one that, right, that ended it? I don't want to be that. I want to be the one that, that 50 years from now, my grandkids, my great-grandkids, if the Lord delays that long, can look back and say, I'm thankful for my great-granddaddy because he taught my grandparents and, he, and, and they taught my parents. I tell you, we need to occasionally step back and think of, of the things that we should be thankful for that have been done before us. That, that have been done before I was ever even born. Things that have been done that, that have brought us to where we are today. And that brings us to our second point. We don't only want to be thankful for the past, but, but we also want to be thankful for the present. You know, the Christian life is, is essentially an offering of thanksgiving to our Creator. Think of passages like Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. It says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You realize that God wants you to be thankful? All right, God wants you to be that one leper who returned. God wants you to be a thankful person. God wants you to look at all the things that you have been blessed with. And if you are a Christian, they are innumerable. To, to, to think of all that God has done on your behalf and, and not to just feel entitled to it and not to just feel like, oh, well, that's what should have been done, but, but to feel deep gratitude and thankfulness for what has been done for us. I mean, because so much has been done for us. I want you to look in a passage, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 is a verse I think we know well. Uh, for the most part, we, we hear it quoted a lot. But what I like is the verses that follow. All right, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. All right, you have that prepositional phrase there at the end, in Christ. And, and what we're told is that if you're in Christ, you have been blessed, not with some, not with a few, not even with a whole lot, but you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. But, but don't think that Paul just stopped right there. Because what Paul's going to do is he's going to go on and tell us exactly what blessings he's talking about. We'll follow this prepositional phrase for the next several verses. He says this, just as he chose us in him. Right? These are those who are in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You realize one of the blessings that Paul's talking about, those spiritual blessings that we who are in Christ receive, is that we will be holy and blameless before him in love. I, I tell you, as I think about the day of judgment, I think about the day that I will stand before God. I tell you, that sends chills up my spine. To think that I'll be holy and blameless before him. Think of all the things, and I know that I'm far from a perfect man, but I will stand before God as holy and blameless. That's a blessing that I need to be thankful for. Look at verse 4. It says, just as he chose us in him, all right, there's that prepositional phrase, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. I'm sorry, I read that one. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he made us accepted in the beloved. So there's, there's that place that you were in the beloved. 
And in the beloved, we are adopted as sons. And in the beloved, we are, as it says, accepted. We're accepted. See, a tragic thought, a whole lot of people, because of their sin, because they're covered in their sin, will not be accepted. But, but we will be adopted as his sons. And, and he will accept us. We'll be holy and blameless before him. Look at verse 7. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We have redemption. That means we're, we're bought back to God. We have forgiveness of sins. That's a blessing. I mean, money cannot buy that. And it's something we ought to be thankful for. Going on into verses 8 and 9, he says, Which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. See, Christians understand uh, his will. They understand that mystery that, that he'll talk about uh, throughout the next several verses. This mystery that, that so many don't understand. But, but when we learned the gospel message, we understood the will of God. I tell you, there are blessings that Christians have that people in this world don't have. That, that are available to all, but they're not in him. And because they're not in him, they don't have these blessings. I tell you, as a Christian... We have been blessed, as verse 3 says, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, it's an absolutely wonderful thing. But look again at another passage with me. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 18. Romans chapter 6, you, you probably know what that passage is. It's the great passage that talks about the idea of, of, of Really, who we belong to? Are we slaves to, to, to sin or are we slaves to righteousness? Are we, are we owned and condemned by our sin or are we owned by and, con, or and saved by Christ? And it talks about baptism and, and, and the gospel message. And, and that, that it's a wonderful chapter from the Bible. But in chapter 6, verses 15 through 18, Paul says, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked, right? But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which you have been delivered. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves to righteousness. Or having obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine, we have been set free from our sin. All right, the sin that, that condemns and the sin that, that separates people from God and the sin that, that stains our soul, we have been set free from. He says, and God be thanked. Right, God be thanked. See, I, I want you to be thankful not only for the things that were done in the past, but I want you to be thankful that today, if you're a Christian, if you have obeyed that form of doctrine which you have been delivered, if you are a Christian, you are free from your sin. That's something to be thankful for. One more, path, one, one more point, point number three. I want you to be thankful for the future. You know, really, that, that's what it's all about. If we think about the past and the things that have been done, and we think about the present and the fact that we can live in this life as holy and blameless, and we think that we can live this life as free from our sin, and we think of all the things that we're blessed with, what it all points towards is the future. What will the future be for the Christian? See, it's not just about what the things that have been done and, and, and the things that uh, that, that are now present. See, there's a whole bunch of things about the future that I don't know. I mean, there's a whole lot about the future. I have no idea. I don't know how long I'll live. I don't know. I don't know about, about my kids. I, I don't know about my grandkids. I don't know if I'll ever have grandkids. If I do, I don't know their names. There's a whole bunch of stuff about the future that I don't know. But what I know is this. What I know is this. I know that there are many promises made by God that are absolute certainties. I know about the future is that God has promised it. And if, the, if God has promised it, then it's something that we could take to the bank. Right? I mean, I mean it, it, it's going to come. It's going to be true. God promised it. 
And if God promises it, I can count on it just as certain as I, as I can know the past, just as certain as I can know the present, I can know the future. And, and you look at what God has promised. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13-18 through 18 says this, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with uh, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Do you realize that if you're a faithful Christian, that one day you will be in the presence of the Lord and will remain in the presence of the Lord forever? We shall always be with him. I mean, such words, Paul says, I want you to comfort each other with. A a thought is is, is, as comforting as any thought could be. That we will be with the Lord forever. Revelation 21 and verse 4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I'm telling you, this world is filled with pain. This world can be filled with death and sorrow and crying. And this world can be filled with hardship. But do you realize that one day, if you are faithful to God, you will go to be with him in a place where there will be no more death. Never again will a tear of sorrow be shed. Never again will you feel pain. Never again. Uh, that's the former things, he says. That's the things that, that are here. Uh, those are the things that this life is accompanied with. But not, not then. See, the future is, is wonderful for the Christian. And you start to understand why Paul said well, what he said in passages like Philippians 1 and verse 21. Where he says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, he was thankful. Paul was, he was thankful for the things that had been done for him. He was thankful for, for the, the blessings that he, he, at that point, was experiencing. But much more thankful he was for the future. Because the life of the Christian, it, it's filled with blessings. But, but the death of the Christian is not the cold, dark end. Right? It's, it's not the end of all these blessings. It's, it's the beginning Of a life where we will be with our Lord forever. In a place where there's no more sorrow or death or crying. A place where there's there's no more pain. Paul said again in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, or 8 through 6 through 8, where where he was nearing his death. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. See, Paul says, <laughs> that's what it's about. I mean, of the things that we have to be thankful for, and, and we should be thankful more than anybody in this world, we should be thankful. And, and as we think about the things that we can be thankful for and should be thankful for, we're thankful for the things in the past and what has been done for us. We're thankful for the blessings that we now receive. But, but as much, if not more than anything, we're thankful for the life that has been prepared for us. We're thankful for what, what we'll have. The home with, with our God. The home with our Lord. I tell you. Let, let's, let's not be like those nine lepers. Who have been blessed so richly. And yet just forget. Or been blessed so richly. And, and probably I would imagine they were even excited. They just forgot that very thankful thing. That, or that very, that very basic thing. 
And that's, that's to give thanks to the one who made it available. I tell you, as we go through this week, I, I look forward to Thanksgiving. And, and Thursday will come uh, if the Lord delays. And, 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 and Thursday will come and, and you know, we'll, we'll enjoy a lot of things. I tell you, I, I look forward to the turkey. I look forward to the pie. I, I look forward to, to, to the good food that we'll eat. But don't let it be about that. Don't, don't let it be just a, a time to get together and, and eat a lot of food. Uh, be thankful to the one who made that food available. More so, be thankful to the one who made, who made your life available. Be thankful for, to the one who, who made your salvation available, who made your hope available, who, who has shown grace and mercy and love. Be thankful to the creator of this world and the creator of you and I. And give thanks to him. And not just Thursday. Uh, be thankful today and tomorrow and the rest of this week and, and the rest of this month. And, and live your life as a life of thanksgiving. All right, again, it's Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Live your life in, in everything you do in thankfulness. As our scripture is read from, from 1 Thessalonians earlier, chapter 5 says, Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks. For this is the will of God the Father. Let's be thankful people. Let's be the one, the leper who returns. Let's not be the nine. Let us always remember the blessings we have and be thankful for them. If you haven't yet had your sins washed away, we want those sins to be washed away from you. We want you to be able to face this Thanksgiving like, like no other Thanksgiving before where you can be thankful for, for move, more than just the food and the clothing and, and the things along those lines. We want you to be able to be thankful for the salvation you now have, for the forgiveness of your sins, for the fact that one day you'll be seen as holy and blameless before God in love, that you've been adopted as his son, that you've been accepted in the beloved, that you've been redeemed from your sins, that you've been forgiven of your sins. We want you to face this Thanksgiving giving and have more to be thankful for than anybody else but i want you to face tonight being able to be thankful i want you to live tomorrow with thanksgiving in your heart i want you to live every day for the rest of your life with the thankfulness that that really can only come from the blessings that our god gives if we can help you experience that thankfulness we want to help you do that if we can baptize you this morning so your sins will be washed away, if we can pray for you, if you, if you need to repent of sin, if we can help you get your life right with God this morning, that's what we want to help you do. And if we can, won't you sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing the invitation song?